Just five years after the total defeat of Nazi Germany, a new jet took to the skies the result of design work started in the war, the work of one of Hitler's favourite aircraft designers. But this incredible achievement did not occur in West Germany or even in Europe. Rather, the jet had been built in a nation that had actually encouraged Nazis to make new lives for themselves, safe from war crimes investigations. That country was Argentina. Argentina, under the rule of President Juan Perón, had even established agents in post-war Italy and Austria to help facilitate the illegal movements of thousands of Nazi war crime suspects to the South American nation, actively courting all sorts of former SS and Nazi Party administrators, scientists, and technicians. In fact, following Germany's defeat in May 1945, countries were scrambling to snatch the Third Reich's best brains for their own national interests. For example, the United States covertly brought 765 former Nazi scientists to America to build ballistic missiles and later space rockets for NASA, ignoring the fact that 85% of them had been SS officers. And many, like Werner von Braun, directly complicit in the use of slave labor to build the V2 rockets that bombarded London towards the end of the war. For example, the V2 program resulted in the deaths of 20,000 slave workers at concentration camps, where they were worked to death, executed, or died of disease and starvation, manufacturing the missiles. Those responsible became honored and lauded members of the U.S. scientific community, and never were tried for their crimes. The Soviet Union and Britain also did the same, all happy to ignore inconvenient pasts in order to help them to win the new Cold War. If you want more detail on Nazi war criminals fleeing Europe, check out my new series Rat Lines on war stories with Mark Felton. Link in the description box below. The Argentine leader Juan Perón was a realist, and knowing that many Nazi fugitives preferred not to work for the Allies, fearful of imprisonment or death once they had outlived their usefulness, he enacted a plan to recruit tens of thousands of specialists from among Nazis in hiding. Argentina already had large German communities. The country was attractive for men who wished to start again in a non-extradition regime. All sorts of unsavoury characters made it to Argentina via the rat lines that ran through Germany into Austria and Italy and thence to South America. SS Obersturmbannführer Adolf Eichmann, the administrative head of the Holocaust, arrived in Argentina in 1950. SS Hauptsturmführer Dr. Josef Mengele, the infamous Auschwitz doctor, arrived safely the year before. Followed by SS Hauptsturmführer Franz Stangl, the former commandant of Sobibor and Treblinka camps, and former SS Hauptsturmführer Klaus Barbie, the infamous Gestapo chief, nicknamed the Butcher of Lyon. Of more use to Peron's military was the arrival in Argentina of two important aircraft designers. The first was French. Emile Duantin arrived in May 1946. One of the pioneers of the French aircraft industry, he had blackened his copybook by working for the collaborationist Vichy regime after the Germans' defeat of France, manufacturing aircraft used by the Germans. After the liberation of France in 1944, Duantin fled to fascist Spain, fearing persecution for his wartime collaboration. From there, he moved to Argentina and developed South America's first jet-powered aircraft, the Pulque One. He was right to fear returning to France. For in 1948, he was sentenced in absentia to 20 years forced labor. The other greater prize for Peron was Kurt Tank, one of Germany's preeminent wartime aircraft designers. Before and during the war, Tank had designed some iconic aircraft. In 1936, he created the Focke-Wulf 200 Condor. An airliner, a maritime patrol aircraft, and also used as Hitler's personal plane. 
Perhaps his most famous design was the Focke-Wulf 190, one of the most used single-seat fighters in Luftwaffe service. Over 20,000 were built. It was, alongside the Messerschmitt 109, the backbone of Germany's fighter defences during the Allied bombing campaign. Tank would go on to create the Focke-Wulf TA-152, a high-altitude interceptor designed to shoot down Allied bombers which flew ever higher. Tank knew his value, and though not in any way a war crime suspect, he was determined to continue designing military aircraft somewhere. Britain and nationalist China both tried to tempt him to work for them, along with the Soviet Union, but Argentina made a better offer, and Tank went to work at its aeronautical institute in Cordoba, using the cover name Pedro Matisse. Many of Tank's Focke-Wulf designers went with him to Argentina, Tank took with him his design library, including plans for a late-war jet-powered fighter that had never been built, the Focke-Wulf TA-183. Desperate for cheap jet fighters to try and halt the Allied bomber offensive, several German aircraft companies had submitted designs for the emergency fighter program, a few of which were actually built, for example the Heinkel 162 Volksjäger or People's Fighter. Kurt Tank designed the FWTA-183 Huckerbein, or Hunchback, designed to succeed the expensive Messerschmitt 262 and all piston engine fighters like the Focke-Wulf 190 in frontline service. Two designs of the aircraft existed, one with a tall T-shaped tail and the other with a more standard tailplane. The wings were swept back at 40 degrees and were mounted mid-fuselage. Due to critical material shortages, the aircraft's fuselage and wing's internal structures were largely wooden and covered in plywood. The prototypes were to be powered by the Junkers Jumo 004B turbojet that also powered the Messerschmitt 262. The pilot sat in a pressurized cockpit with a bubble canopy for excellent vision and it was armed with four MK-108 30mm cannons arranged around the air intake. Top speed was planned to be 1,000 kilometers an hour at 7,000 meters, or 23,000 feet. Focke-Wulf stated in February 1945 that it could produce 300 aircraft per month, and a total of 16 prototypes were ordered to be built, with a first flight scheduled for May 1945. However, the Focke-Wulf facilities fell to British forces on the 8th of April 1945, before any hookabines had been completed. However, a few years later, and Tank was able to resurrect the TA-183 project in Argentina. Working with many of his original team, Tank modified the 183 design, placing the wings at a shoulder-mounted position. This was done to avoid a heavy fuselage spar pass-through structure going around the engine. Though the change resulted in deep stall problems at high angles of attack, Tank planned to correct these problems. In 1950, the Argentine Air Force used the British Gloucester Meteor F-4 as its main interceptor, but Argentina wanted to produce homegrown jet fighters. They had first tried with exiled French designer Duantin, who produced the Polki 1 in 1947. The design was not a success. Kurt Tunk would use the Rolls-Royce Neen 2 jet engine from the Polki design, and the Focke-Wulf TA-183 design would be modified to accommodate the much larger British engine. The fuselage was scaled up. The undercarriage from the Polki 1 was also incorporated into Tank's new aircraft, now called the Polki 2. The T-shaped tail was swept back 50 degrees, and the cockpit had a bubble canopy with armour and a bulletproof windscreen. Armament was planned to be four 20mm cannon, staggered in two pairs along each side of the fuselage. In order to test the design, two unpowered glider versions were built and tested in 1948-49. They were constructed by Reimar Horten, of the famous Horten brothers, who had built the Nazi flying wing late in the war and also fled to Argentina. Tank flew some of the missions himself. Various problems were resolved and alterations made. But Tank faced a problem. Argentina lacked the up-to-date machinery and tools required to build jets, and each aircraft was essentially hand-built. 
The first powered flying prototype was built in 1950 and first flew on the 27th of June using Focke-Wulf test pilots. It proved a difficult plane to land and had stability problems at speeds above 700 km an hour. Modifications mostly corrected these problems. After several more flights and more modifications, Tank made a demonstration flight on the 8th of February 1951 before President Perón, government officials, foreign diplomats and military attaches, and a large crowd of locals. Se nos hace difícil seguirlo con la cámara. Luego, en otra pasada más lenta, puede observarse la gallardía del vuelo de este avión, que es orgullo de la aviación militar argentina. The proving test flights were a success, and the Argentine Air Force ordered 12 aircraft. But later in 1951, Argentine Air Force test pilots reported severe vibration at a thousand kilometers an hour. Tank ordered the prototype grounded, but Argentine pilot Captain Manuel ignored the instructions and conducted aerobatic maneuvers. During a high G-force turn, one of the wings came off. Manuel managed to eject, but his parachute only partially deployed and he was killed. The cause of the crash was faulty workmanship, not the design. A third prototype was built, incorporating many changes. It first flew on the 23rd of September 1952. It was due to be demonstrated before President Perón on the 11th of October, but two days beforehand, pilot Otto Behrens crashed at low level and was killed. A fourth prototype was built in 1953, fitted with cannons and modified to resolve more problems, notably the design's deep stall issues. It first flew on the 20th of August 1953. The Netherlands and Egypt both expressed interest in purchasing the Polki II, but eventually decided to buy readily available fighters from elsewhere. The Dutch bought the Republic F-84F Thunderstreak and F-86G Thunderjet, while Egypt went for the Soviet MiG-15. The thing that killed off Kurt Tank's jet was a severe financial crisis in Argentina in 1953. Put simply, Argentina couldn't afford to make the Polki II, especially with no overseas orders on the books. Tank's contract expired in January 1955, and Perón terminated the project. However, the one remaining Polki II, the fourth arm prototype, did see combat, ironically used alongside Meteor F-4s to attack Peronist forces during a coup d'etat in September 1955 that forced Peron from office. The new government forced Tank and many other Germans with Third Reich connections out of the country, Tank going to India, where he developed the HF-24 Marut supersonic fighter. The last use of a Kurt Tank-built Polki II was in 1956, during an attempt to make a record flight from Cordoba to Buenos Aires. The aircraft overran the runway in Buenos Aires and was damaged beyond repair. The aging Meteor F-4s served on, but the Argentine Air Force seemed determined that the Polki II should be adopted, and the new government allowed orders for 100. A fifth prototype was therefore built in 1959 and flew the same year. But by now the fighter was considered obsolete and too politically sensitive because of its connection to Perón and Nazis. Instead, the new Argentine government was wooed by the Americans and received 28 rather tatty second-hand F-86 F-40 Sabres for a very low price. Prototype number 5 is today preserved at the Argentine Air Force Museum at Airbase Moron, the only example surviving of Nazi Germany's last jet fighter, the Polki II. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. You can also visit my new audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. Details below. You can help support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details also in the description box.